Welcome to the Connected Leadership Podcast Live. I'm Andy Laparta. Uh, really glad if you're joining us live, it's great to have you here. And please say hello in the comments, whether you're on LinkedIn, Facebook or YouTube. Um, and as we go through uh, the conversation to come, uh, feel free to ask any questions or share your own experiences. I think today is going to be um, a very powerful conversation. Uh, and I think it may resonate with a lot of people. Um, I'm I'm talking to my good friend Nick Johnson. I met Nick um, quite a long time ago, a number of years ago, um, when he lived in London and he ran a group called European Young Professionals. Nick and I met at a talk I gave at the Swedish Chamber of Commerce uh, and he came up to me after the presentation and said, I've got this new group of young professionals from all over the world uh, we meet and network in London. Would you come and give a talk for them? And uh, uh, I did that and, and made a lot of good friends and stayed friends with them to today, through to today. And Nick, uh, very much among those. Um, since then, Nick's uh, Nick's travelling has taken him mainly around Asia, uh, and he brought me into work with him again in Vietnam uh, in uh, two different roles, I think, uh, if I if I remember rightly. Uh, and he's now based in Singapore. Um, where he runs a mastermind group for for senior executives. One thing that I didn't know the last couple of times I called up with Nick when we were in Singapore is the struggles that he'd faced and the journey he'd been on. And it turned out that while I was writing Just Ask, um, Nick was going through uh, very much the, the similar sort of journey to the ones that I was sharing. And, and I referenced Nick's journey um, or work since as a result of his journey briefly in Just Ask. Um, uh, and um, he's got a new book coming out, um, for which he, he invited me to write the foreword, um, the book called Executive Loneliness, um, that's coming out imminently. And so it seemed like a good time to invite Nick onto the podcast to share his journey. So Nick, uh, good afternoon to you. Good morning from us. Uh, welcome, welcome to the Connected Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much, Andy. It's great to be here with you today. So just a reminder, if you're just joining us on Facebook, LinkedIn or YouTube, please say hello in the comments. It's nice to know you're there. Um, and um, uh, if you're if you're watching this uh, on the replay, also please do comment as we go through because I do look at them uh, and do pick them up even after the event and Nick's tagged or Nick will be tagged in that as well. So Nick can pick up your messages and comments after the event as well. So Nick, I've given um, an introduction there and I've touched on your journey, um, but I can't do it justice. I mean, reading your book uh, really opened my eyes. You know, we'd obviously talked and I had a sense of what had gone on uh, by the stage, you know, that you sent me the, the manuscript, um, but I didn't know the extent of it. Um, and, and reading the book gave me... A, a, uh, you know a very powerful insight into what you'd gone through so i think it would be a good start to 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 set the the, the the scene so to speak so can you just share um your own journey what happened to you and and how you dealt with it and what led you to writing a book about it sure uh, let me give you a brief introduction to my story so basically i was born in sweden i moved to australia in the late 90s where I studied and then I started my career in Asia since 2004 and living as an expat mainly in Thailand, Indonesia and Vietnam and going from job to job from country to country which is quite common as you are an expat you do a contract and assignment and then you move to the next job and yes I did a stint also during that time in London which is when I met you Andy. So I think living as an expat abroad uh, you don't have much of a safety net uh, you don't have anyone to protect you should you lose your job and and so on uh, you're very much on your own or you're heavily relying on the company that the company are providing for you all the permits to work there the legal rights to even be in the country the medical care the housing and so on is all provided to you and that is something that i always was quite worried about i was perhaps worrying too much about it. What will happen if, and what will happen if I lose my job? What will happen then? And uh, that was something that was back on my mind. And I, of course, met people who have lost the jobs and I could see the trauma it caused for their families uh, when something happened when you're away from home. Um, 
and then it happened to me. I was performing well in my role, but suddenly I lost my job. Uh, and uh, what I did then was to try to cover up. I didn't want to uh, re reveal what had happened to my family and friends back home in Sweden. I tried to basically show a, a professional first aid, uh, not telling anyone what had happened. I felt this is my own uh, journey. I have to find a new job now. And that's what I did. So I kept it all inside me. Uh, having starting to have quite a lot of anger inside me against my company who did this to me. Uh, so rather than giving up and moving back to Sweden, I was fighting on in Vietnam until I got a new job. And that's when I met you and I did well in that job for many years. I worked for a fashion company wearing that pink suit, I'm sure you remember. <laughs> Can never forget that pink suit. <laughs> yeah. So that was a, a company I was with for five years and I did well, so well that they actually promoted me to a bigger role to head up uh, the company in Indonesia. And just as I came over there, uh, I had moved my family over. My son was five years old uh, into the school. We just moved into a new house. Then there was uh, new investors who bought the company and they were laying off 300 people, including me. So that was the second time as an expat, I lost my job in a foreign country. And that time, it was just too much for me. It had already been a hard move to just move country. It took us about six per months just to get the permits. And I was over there in Indonesia three months before my son and wife. So when we finally got together, uh, it was starting all over again. And I, I was just not ready to handle that at that time. And I basically pushed away my uh, wife and my son. And I said, why don't you go home to Sweden? and just be there, leave me here, and I will find another job. Uh, so that was uh, the start of uh, my own journey, basically just isolating myself in a foreign country um, and then trying to find new, new assignments. I jumped from job to job, and I was not feeling well. I started to go to the bar after work and uh, drink beer instead of going for exercise. Uh, as you know, Andy, I'm quite a fan of cycling and running and swimming and so on, and I, I lost interest in that. I replaced my good habits with bad habits and I started to hang around the wrong people, the people who were going to the bars after work instead of going for a, a tennis match, for example. It, it, it all changed. And by being then by myself and not having anyone really to speak to, I was very quiet and I don't think we had much touch. Uh, and it, when I was in Indonesia, I didn't contact anyone. There was no one who knew what was going on apart from a few nice photos on Facebook. Um, so that I found then another job, a great position as a general manager for a big medical company in Indonesia, big package. And of course, I was thinking, should I move back my wife and my son to Indonesia? But I kept saying, let's just wait, let me pass the probation. And then it was, no, let me give it another six months just to make sure. So I was so insecure then being in my third big role here that What's going to happen? Will I lose my job again? So I, I never got back my confidence in myself or in the company. I started to lose uh, trust in people. And I was you know, just very sad, anxious, angry inside me. And uh, it led to the point where my ex-wife, who it is now, we divorced. And uh, my ex-wife and my son are still in Sweden today, uh, now five years later, uh, because of the journey that started then. And it went so bad that I felt so insecure in my job that I actually resigned from this job. Uh, despite doing well, I resigned from the job. Uh, despite I didn't really have anything else to do after. So that is how, how my journey really started. And, and the, the three jobs, then the two I lost and one I resigned from. And there I was lost, didn't know what was home. And uh, I moved back to Vietnam for a stint to see is that home. And it wasn't home. I just got more sick there. Uh, to the point where I moved to Singapore, and that's somehow where the turn came. And that is uh, uh, when I started to get better. So, I mean, there's a there's a lot of uh, subtexts that we could we could look at there. Um, so we'll try and sort of take it piece by piece. Um, I think the the core theme of your your story um, is about the isolation, about the disruption, um, and about not having an anchor that comes with working away from home, working as an expat. Um, and, you know, you talk about the culture of drinking after work. Of course, we have that in the UK. You have that in Sweden. 
Um, but in the expat world, it tends to be, um, in my experience, a lot stronger, a, a, a lot more a core part because of, you know, people don't have the community ties that they, they would do if they were commuting back home. They don't have the longer commuting distances and so forth. Um, how much do you think this impacts people working away from their home more than people um, who work close to where they were brought up or, or where their family uh, are based, where they have that, those community ties. How important do you think those community ties are? They are very important, uh, Andy, and I have seen a difference in depending on which country I moved to. Uh, and you tend to you know, hang around the people you meet your first one or two weeks when you come to a new country. So if uh, the first few nights you move to a new country and you go out to the local bar uh, where you move in on the hotel you stay, you meet some friends and maybe those are the few friends that you save the phone number and hang out with. But instead, if you really make an effort, and I've done this, especially now when I moved to Singapore, I made sure that I contacted the local running clubs before. I knew where the swimming pool club was, where my swim academy is. And I signed up for these things even before I was in Singapore. Uh, so I, I really prepared for it to make sure that I should end up in in, in good company and, and have some good close friends with healthy habits. So I would say uh, uh, we are in charge of this ourselves, but it's easy to fall into uh, not having a plan or strategy for your social circle or your relationships is uh, set up to failure, right? So... Um... It's, 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 there's a key element where it's down to you to find that community, to find the right community and commit to it. And you talked about how you let those good habits slip. Um, what about the, the, the role of the organisation that's employing you? You know, there, there's, I, from, from listening to you and from reading the book, there's a balance to be struck between doing... It seems like if the organisation goes too far, in trying to support you and does everything for you, they cre create the scenario that led to your struggles because they create such a reliance on that organization, such a reliance on the job um, that you find the pressures of worrying about losing your job built. So where's the right line for that organization to support people to be there for their senior executives, but at the same time, um, to give people enough freedom to get the independence that they need as well. That's a big challenge, Andy. And uh, I mean, in the expat packages, you also have a clause traditionally that if you are terminated, uh, they also ship you back home, the, the, including a container with your belongings to your home country. Uh, but the further you live away from home, uh, the more scared you are about moving back home because you may be even forgot about the language. Uh, at least if I pick up a Swedish book, a business book at the airport, I don't think I even understand it. I left Sweden in the <laughs> late 90s. So the yeah. business language I, is, is not what I know. So, so the fear of moving back is big also. So it's really hard while the companies are trying to protect you by saying, well, if you, we would move you back home here if you like. Uh, and they offered that to me, but I declined it because I was scared of that as well. I figured that my CV is probably more up to date here. Uh, wherever I was, and uh, this is probably where my uh, where I can get a new job. That at least was my decisions. Maybe they were driven out of fear. Maybe I should have tried. Uh, but yeah, I th think it's. But to answer your question, it's very hard for a company to uh, to help you the whole way. I mean, they can only do so much. And once I lost my job uh, in, in a company, you cannot hold them accountable to pay for your housing and anything else left you stand on your own feet in a new country that is where the challenge is and that that when reading your book that seemed to be the biggest trigger for you particularly when you took on that new role and you had um you ha i mean we're going to be uh, recording a uh, podcast soon looking at imposter syndrome and that seemed to be a big issue for you when you went into the new role is that people were telling you that you were doing well but you refused to believe them and you, you weren't moving your wife and, and son out and you weren't putting down those more permanent routes because you were almost expecting to be fired uh, at any point. How much is that driven by the transitory nature of, of, the, uh, you know, of the lifestyle? Um, how, how much do you think comes from somewhere else? 
Yeah, I think that is an insecurity that built uh, that I built up over many years, and uh, as I said, also happening to me, but also happening to so many people. I think that is many of ex us expats have this underlying fear of this happening, and uh, to the point where I actually addressed this. It's about a year and a half ago now. I went to see a psychologist, a therapist, to really discuss about this, and she also helped me as a coach to develop everything I could to be more. Uh, on my own feet uh, to have more plan B's and so on and that involved everything from changing the kind of uh, permit I'm on when I'm working in Singapore that I have a personal permit which is not linked to a company but something yeah. should I or if something happen here I can remain in the country a few more months for example so there are things that we can do to empower ourselves and that is, I learned this the hard way um, and but it's similar, like most people would think that it's, it might be good to have it in my apartment when I get older, at least that I have some some property or something that I can rely on. But of course, when you are in a foreign country, and uh, most of these countries, you cannot even own land or buy property. So you're, you're just relying on paying uh, expensive money often for rent and so on. That's part of the challenge as well. So, okay, so let's let's move on. And we've talked about the organization, the, the employing organization's role. What about other people? I, I want to sort of look at this from, from two perspectives. So first of all, how, you know, the, the, the book is called Executive Loneliness. And we're talking, because of your experience, about how this is impacting people who are working away from home. But executive loneliness is a challenge that, that hits a lot of leaders wherever they may be, whatever their circumstances how much did you feel isolated in your role? Um, did you feel able to share your challenges with other people within your organization or at peer level? Um, where did you get it wrong? And then where did you get it right as you started to build towards recovery? I didn't share any of my struggle internally in the companies. I think, uh, and in my book, I also share some survey findings where I ask these questions too executives in Singapore, if they were suffering mentally, would they talk to the, their company about it? And about 75% wouldn't uh, talk mm. to the company. And I fell in uh, for that as well, uh, because I was trying to prove myself. Even uh, one of the jobs where I was uh, laid off from, I was hired as a future managing director. And at the time, I was uh, the area sales director, I think was my title. So I was on my way to become the national sales director and then I could be an MD. So you're sort of competing with other people in other countries at that level. And it's about who really is the most mature and ready for the next step. And, and, and to be seen as strong doesn't necessarily mean to be seen as vulnerable. And that is uh, unfortunately the point here that people are trying to show the best of them and want to show that they are tough, that they can go through hardships and deliver results. And that is what I learned, especially coming up and doing sales and business development, that is the culture. You've got to be tough. And even if it's challenging times, uh, even if it's a global financial crisis, you've got to fight through it and deliver the results. So that's the school of thought that I've been brought up with. And so you found yourself bottling up these feelings. You had no one to share them with at all. That's right. So, so, I mean, I know that you agree with me now and it's something that I talk about a lot at the moment. Everything that you've just outlined is completely wrong. You know, maybe that's quite a blunt opinion, but it's, I feel very strongly about it. This idea that vulnerability is a weakness. Yes, there are times where you've got to give direction as a leader. Yes, there are times where you've got to show um, positivity, certainty, whatever it might be. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't share with certain people you can't build a network around you to give you feedback to act as a sounding board it doesn't mean that you can't ask for inputs from all different people at what point did you recognize that and how has it changed the way you engage now and how about the leaders that are members of your egn network so i mean even since i knew you uh, way back and I was never shy to ask for help, especially mm. if it came to business development, networking opportunity, relationships, opening doors. Uh, uh, that is some of my strengths are right there. Uh, but what I didn't do, I didn't ask for help about the things that were 
perhaps the ones I needed help the most with, uh, the things that would show myself as vulnerable and show myself as weak. Uh, I had not learned to share those uh, feelings with someone. Uh, being in Sweden, we are quite distant people. We don't really open up. We don't talk uh, uh, very much deeply inside families, for example, especially in our generation. Uh, so I wasn't brought up with that. And uh, living then away, moving from country to country, I never developed very strong friendships with anyone that I would open up with. So it only came after my crash when I learned uh, to open up step by step. Uh, uh, that is what it took. And it's it's now three years ago I was in the middle of it. And it's interesting you say being raised in Sweden had had an impact uh, on your ability to be vulnerable and open up. Um, it's one of the questions I get asked a lot and, and looked at in the book. Um, do you think that, do you see cultural differences? Because obviously you're working in a melting pot of people from all over the world. Do you see differences in the way people approach this and can you pin it down to cultural or gender differences? I think uh, it, it definitely can be uh, based on the upbringing, how your parents uh, were treating this and how they opened up about it. It can also be if you have a religious background, for example, you come from a religious family, then uh, these kind of matters might have been discussed and dealt with in a, a different manner as well. And yes, per gender, uh, I think uh, what I've seen and even the research, and it's inside my book, I have a chapter talking about this, that. Uh, women seem to be a little bit more open. They have a few close friends who they really will talk to. And the ones who are struggling are especially men in the mid 40s, uh, up, up to perhaps early 50s. Uh, expat men, if you are single uh, uh, as well and living and working in Asia, that's then you're basically doomed. <laughs> the best is to pack your bag and move home, as I say in the book. <laughs> Very blunt ad ad advice. Um, so, you, you, you're now running mastermind groups for um, senior executives. This is obviously, and I've spoken for, for uh, your EGN group in, in Singapore, um, and it's very clear that everyone understands your message and your philosophy. Um, how did you introduce that? Because people, I'm guessing, didn't join the mastermind group for comps and conversations about vulnerability. Uh, although a mastermind group, you you know, for most people that you need that to make it work. Not everyone will recognize that coming in. How was your message received originally? And have you seen people come on a journey with you? Um, it has been positively reviewed. Uh, um, when I first spoke about it, it was when a, a colleague and friend of mine uh, died from suicide in 2019. That's mm. when I decided to really speak up about this. And my first message was a video on LinkedIn that went viral. You had instantly 35,000 views, hundreds of comments, and people wrote to me privately and so on. And everyone said, yes, thank you for talking about this. This was way before COVID, and no one else was talking about it at the time. Uh, the fact that I was vulnerable and, and that was so well received and that instantly people came to me and that's what uh, ignited me to actually do a survey of senior executives in Singapore to really find out because I thought when I got such strong response here, it must be more underlying issues that and I'm not alone to have had these feelings. And that was my intention then to really, with this survey, to find this out. And the survey led to more than 50 interviews uh, where I spoke with senior executives. And uh, I was just shocked by the result. And, and when, when you started having that conversation, um, so you had people reach out to you uh, as a result of the LinkedIn posts and so forth. Um, have you had any resistance? Have people been stuck in that space of no, you don't show you don't show vulnerability, or has it purely been uh, positive? Uh, it has been uh, highly, highly positive. There was one or two of the members uh, who didn't renew the membership of EG, and they felt a bit uncomfortable by having these mm. conversations about suicide and so on. But that's yeah. we're talking to uh, out of uh, perhaps a few thousands who come forward and support it. I mean, instead. Uh, when I did that post, uh, that video, I was instantly contacted by many of the Chambers of Commerce, the Singapore Women Association, and, and many other speaking organizations. And I was invited to give my keynote about 20 times uh, uh, as a result of this 
and as I then presented the survey findings, and I got so many people saying how great it was that we spoke about it. That's what then encouraged me to start even writing the book about it. I, I mean, I think it's great that you're doing it and putting it out there, and I'm not surprised at the response you're getting. You touched on COVID and the impact of COVID. Um, how do you think that has impacted executives, and do you think people are more likely to, to share their own journey and their own story now? Um, so I did a survey before COVID when I basically asked the executives, uh, are they depressed or have they ever been depressed? Uh, and and they 30% of them said yes. Uh, and I did the same survey now to the same group of people in December here 2020, so in the middle of the pandemic, and that had doubled to 60%. So that obviously shows uh, that yeah. as business leaders, we've gone through some extremely challenging times. They've been dealing with big layoffs and uh, and so on, and it's been extremely difficult times for senior executives. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that it's had a huge impact, and I've seen it firsthand. I have uh, seen, I've heard about suicides. I have friends who uh, even died from suicide during the pandemic uh, from, uh, who, from isolation. I'm really sorry to hear that. And I, I, it has been very tough on a lot of people. Um, I think it's really positive that we're talking about it and, and that's going to help us going forward. Do you see this having a permanent, leading to a permanent change in the way that we address these issues? Once COVID hit history, something we talk about, do you remember when? Will we go back um, to normal? So sadly, uh, people still don't feel comfortable to talk with the companies about it. And I also asked that question. It's uh, I got the same findings as before. So despite that people are more depressed now, uh, they are not ready to talk to the company about it the, because they're perhaps even more scared to lose a job now when the job market is a little bit challenging and it's even difficult to move home uh, uh, to your country now with COVID restrictions and quarantine and so on. It's very, very difficult times uh, for relocations overall. Uh, so indeed, uh, that hasn't changed much. What that has changed are a few people stepping forward. Like myself, I already started this journey before COVID and I haven't changed my plan. Uh, the, the book is coming out uh, very soon. Uh, but others are now also coming forward. And it's it's very few, but in my book, I have interviewed a few people who are even ready to step forward with their names and title. And uh, they've been featured in a few magazines and newspapers and radios where we had some interviews uh, in the last year. So COVID, uh, COVID have had a, a small a positive effect that we are a little bit more open, but not enough. Yeah, that's my fear as well, is that we, we're going to just go back to old habits and uh, you and I have got to keep uh, banging the drum uh, and encouraging some change. Um, so, OK, so with the work you've done on the book, the book isn't just sharing your story. It shares your story, but it shares advice and, and guidance on, on how to deal with this moving forward. So what would you say to individuals who find themselves in the position you were, where they're feeling insecure, um, they're unsure of their future, they don't feel able to share with other people. Um, with the pandemic, it may well have, uh, have added an extra layer to that. Um, and they're worried about looking weak um, by sharing those challenges. What sort of five steps could they um, could they follow to to get them out of that vicious cycle and into a more positive one? Well, uh, one thing that I clearly clarify in the book and the lifesaver, the turning point for me was when I started to speak. Uh, first speaking to myself to even understand that I need to speak up. And, and, and then I started to tell uh, my new wife who I got married to uh, then. And then I started to seek help. I started to go to a doctor, share to a doctor what had happened. That led me to a therapist. That led me to join a, a, an anonymous support group uh, where I started to share my story. And for every time I started to share my story, for every, I felt relieved afterwards. And I realized very quickly that people could indeed help. Uh, so it was very, very quickly. The, from uh, lying in my bed thinking that I was going to die, uh, I basically turned everything around in a couple of weeks. I had the biggest hopes and drives and motivation 
that perhaps I ever had in my life. It was like just switching uh, on the light. It was just from black to white. So get out there, talk about it, get some people around you who can support you and, and stop stop being on your own effectively. Yes. What about organisations? What can organisations be doing um, to change their culture uh, and to encourage people to, to reach out? So in my case, the, the, the organisations that I then started to speak about it was in, indeed uh, a support group. You have many of these support groups uh, in Australia, there's one that where I gave my keynote recently called Mentoring Men. Uh, there you have many of the anonymous support groups. I joined one for problem drinkers. I picked up a, a drinking problem at the time, and that was a fantastic community where I was encouraged to be uh, anonymous and share my stories and get support from others who've been there before. So depending on what your problem is, there are a lot of support organizations there that you can speak to. But of course, what really helped me as well was indeed uh, the therapists as well. Um, you can, of course, join also networking organizations uh, uh, such as the Chambers of Commerce and so on. And what we have done at the EGN, because we know that people are quite shy when they are joining, we make sure and we carefully select uh, a peer group with the new member. We don't just allocate them, you belong to this uh, peer group. We show them a few groups and they can select. And then we send their profile for approval to this peer group. And then when they're introduced in the first meeting, they are basically need to share their expertise they're bringing into the group. And they are, have to lay on the table one of the challenges they are faced with right now. And we then, and our share, is working with them to prepare for this. So it's a small presentation where the first thing they ask is to be vulnerable, to put something on the table which is where they are struggling inside the work. So that basically the first thing that is happening in this meeting is that the other members of the group will help them to solve this problem. So they will walk out of the first meeting feeling that, wow, I finally let go of that that I've been holding on my chest for so long. And it was amazing, everyone helped me. So when you create this culture internally in an organization where everyone is encouraged to share honestly and deeply, uh, then magic happens. What we also do is we get everyone to sign a non-disclosure agreement so that everyone knows that this is a safe and protected place where you're encouraged to open up. And yes, we are not talking about uh, the deep mental health related issues uh, necessarily inside the meetings, but it can be a huge conflict which you have with your boss or your team. Uh, something might have happened in the company and you cannot discuss this with your boss because the problem is perhaps the board or the owners or the boss himself. Then this is your safe place to solve this before it becomes a major issue that you might go and drink over and not sleep over. So that is what we're working with. So any organization like that uh, it would be of huge support as well. So I, 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 a couple of things that, that I got from that is, is I think that you encouraging people to be vulnerable and share something straight away sets the tone, sets the expectation. So there might be a fear for some that you're throwing people in at the deep end, but in, in some ways that forces them to swim as well. And I guess you don't have to share your deepest vulnerabilities at that stage, but it's just about getting people used to the process. The other thing is that, you know, you talked about going to external organisations. So I, I guess it's, in, it's inherent on companies to encourage their leaders and their teams generally um, to seek support and to find places they can open up, but they don't have to host it themselves. They can just signpost people to somewhere where they can find the help that they need. Would that that would fit with with the way you would approach it? Yeah, certainly. And uh, there's many organisations, even uh, as an expat. If you're away, I I gave my talk last Monday to the one of the Rotary clubs here, and they have groups of eight who who can meet now here during the COVID regulations, and where they are speaking quite openly. And they invited me to share a little bit about my story to even create more openness and. It just shows that the more we we actually share these our stories, if someone we're taking the lead here, then someone else will feel well. Next time it's my turn to share my story. Great stuff. Now, um, very quickly before we we wrap up this part of the interview, if you're watching live and you're posting comments, I see on my screen there is an error loading comments, so I can't see your comments. So I apologise for that, but please do keep posting them, and Nick and I will look at them afterwards if there are some there on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. 
we're going to move on in a moment. I'm going to wrap up this main interview and Nick and I are going to um, have a, a shorter interview more about professional relationships. So when I say goodbye to Nick, please hang around and keep watching us. That's a little bit behind the scenes for everyone. So Nick, when uh, when is the book out? When can people get a hold of it? Uh, it should be out in about one month. We're working on the layout now and then it will go to Amazon after that. So it's very close. Fantastic. So it's Executive Loneliness by Nick Johnson. That's J-O-N-S-S-O-N. So uh, make sure you keep your eye open for that on Amazon. Uh, Nick, we're going to talk to you again uh, about your professional relationships and the highs and lows of those over the years and other books you'll recommend. And that will be out in our Thursday podcast. But for the moment, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Andy. Great. So we will, I'll just reset my timer and we will go straight on with that other interview if you're happy with that. Um, so yeah, apologies for anyone who is following. Um, uh, it's, it's frustrating because I sort of, I love the engagement. Then maybe everyone's still uh, sort of getting started on their days and there isn't any, but it says there's an error loading comment. So I have no way of knowing. I'll find out afterwards. Um, Nick, thank you for that. So we're going to um i'm just gonna ask you three questions we'll see where the conversation goes um uh, but we'll start off with looking at the positive role relationships have played with your career in your career to date okay thank you andy so uh, the positive uh, yeah the positive relationships i would say i think the strength andy and that's why i met you already back in london 2006 I always reached out to speakers, presenters, and coaches, and I built up a big network of them all around the world. And I think that's how I built the YP, and that's how I invited you uh, back in London to give a talk there. And I still do the same job today, basically, at EGN. Uh, so that has helped me tremendously. And that is, I think, where my passion is, by trying to match you know, people like yourself who have an amazing product and a good uh, platform and a nice talk with the right audience. Uh, so that is now, uh, even 15 years later, it's still what I'm doing, and, and I will keep doing that. So, so for you, it, it's it's a constant stream of reaching out, and from the sound of it, taking <laughs> taking yourself out of the equation is a phrase that I use a little bit of matchmaking. But that's, you know, what sort of opportunities have come up for you in your career as a result of building those connections previously? Um, I have used these connections in my work in different ways. It doesn't matter which company I work with. I, I still uh, found in uh, three or four organizations I managed to use the same people. Uh, one of them is a fantastic public speak trainer. And since I worked in sales and management teams, I always needed someone who can train them in public speaking. And uh, this gentleman would fly from India to Philippines when we did it there to Indonesia. And I keep coming back to the same contacts. And that's why I guess I keep coming back to you, Andy. We worked in London. You supported me with EYP. Uh, we linked up with the Swedish Chamber of Commerce. And in Vietnam, I think it was three different occasions. It was yeah. with the company I work with, but two other organizations and also with the media. Uh, and now, hopefully, in Singapore as well, when travel is back on, I'm on the outlook for to think about how can we get Andy to, to Singapore. What's, what's really refreshing is that for a lot of people when you know when they think of the word networking which is a, a word that i've moved away from for a large degree because of the negative uh, preconceptions about it when they think about the word networking they think it's people looking to sell what you're referencing is people buying and having trusted suppliers and it's easy to forget that a business balance sheet has two sides to it hence balance uh, and you want to know that you can bring in people who are going to provide you with value for money, who you trust to deliver what you're looking for. And having that peace of mind um, can be key as well. So having your network in place to provide the right suppliers can be as important as bringing in uh, prospects uh, for you. So, uh, you know, it's just refreshing to hear you position it like that. Relationships don't always run smoothly. Um, and things can go wrong. So where, where has it gone wrong for you? And, and what have you learned from, from that? 
relationships goes wrong when you don't have a plan for it. I think you need to have a strategy um, around relationship building as everything else. It's a two-way thing and uh, you cannot only take and ask. You have to be there to support and guide mm. uh, others when they need you as well. Uh, but yeah, the relationships you end up when you walking into the wrong bar or the wrong place and uh, uh, and you might you know continue to start a relationship on the wrong basis and again referring back to uh, perhaps the pub or the bar joining the local darts team might not come with the best habits and the best relationships at least uh, that was the case in Asia when I joined those places uh, it just didn't have any good effect for me so but when I Ryan join a swim squad for example that great things come, come from that it seems like healthy habits leads to healthy relationships and you talked about that in our in our monday podcast interview um when you said that you fell into the wrong company and you you dropped your good behavior uh, and and replaced it with with negative behaviors there's an oft quoted um uh, comment that you you are you whatever you achieve is equal to the five people you spend most of your time with um, and I think one of the things clear from what you've said there is the importance to you of finding people who share positive values with you and finding people like that. Have you, how did you approach it when you, you had to shift relationships? You recognised what had gone, gone wrong and you needed to lose those toxic relationships. How did you handle that? Well, uh, in my case, many times it was moving to a new country and then I was really thinking about it in a strategic way before and uh, as I mentioned also when we spoke last time was that I even prepared before I, I moved to a new country by joining the right clubs and reaching out by email before connecting with some people to really have, have it planned rather than just ad hoc and by luck. But to move away from some people, uh, yeah, just the standard uh, stop replying and and so on. Uh, I, I, I haven't had a, an opportunity to face someone when I had to tell them really I don't want you in my life. I think that's not going to make anyone happy. So sometimes you can just quiet things down and, and slowly walk away and move away from it and select some other people to fill your life instead. Have, have any of those people who you feel that didn't share your values or, or were pursuing the wrong behaviours, have any of them heard you speak about your journey since then? Uh, and said anything to you? Uh, yes, a few of them are following me on social media and so on. And uh, there's been perhaps a few who's been questioning my journey because what I did uh, then two and a half years ago was to really address and look at myself uh, with a fitness coach and also nutritionist and so on to look at what do I need to change in my life. And uh, the diet was a big thing. I had to lose 20 kilo, which I did and alcohol had to go and I have not had any alcohol for two and a half years as of now mm. and uh, that was a decision I had to make in order to turn my life around and yes I might have lost a few friends over, over that decision uh, simply because I don't want to go and spend time in the bar after work uh, and, uh, and and I don't miss those relationships. The, a couple of the good friends that I did use to go to the bar and drink with they are still remaining as my close friends and they supporting uh, what I'm doing and even a, a few of them said make sure that you, you sign, I sign a book and send to them when it's ready. Oh, that's great it, and it, I've been through a similar journey you know I, I um, you know I was never a massive drinker but I, I, I drank um, and I drank socially you know heavily on occasion so some binge drinking particularly around football or parties and I've had probably two half glasses of beer when there's been leftover beer when I've been cooking in the last year um, I've, that's all I've drank in the last year I'm not teetotal but you know I'm pretty much teetotal at the moment and it is interesting how you know it's not the first time in my life I've done that but it's interesting how some people don't get it and they define you by your ability to drink copious amounts of alcohol while others like you for who you are and if you want to drink a lime and soda you drink a lime and soda um that's absolutely fine and it's a good way to find out how strong a friendship really is what people value you for um yes i, I agree key. with that yeah mm. um okay and then finally um on the short podcast we um we look at the books and the podcasts and the, the talks that ha have really had an impact on you and we're trying to build up a library of great recommendations, great resources. So what are you going to add to our library? 
Well, uh, Andy, I have to say through my support groups, I, I got a lot of great material. So that's what I've been following. Uh, uh, the, uh, a lot of it is uh, the anonymous uh, sort of the steps. Uh, that's where I've been finding a lot of materials. Uh, otherwise, uh, I've been a big fan of Simplicity and uh, Brian Tracy, for example, yeah. who I had a pleasure also to bring to Vietnam twice. Uh, if I'm off track and I need to find my path back, picking up one of his books is just fantastic. Such as goal setting. Uh, if, if you need to, you know, kickstart something, you need. Uh, if you can, if you don't have a coach by your side, at least a simple book like the One of Goals by Brian Tracy, so you can set some measurable goals for yourself and keep achieving and getting back on track. That has really helped me. Uh, other than that, uh, I do like uh, audio books simply because I can take them when I'm running or exercising. And there, uh, I, I'm trying now to build uh, uh, some wealth because I have lost jo jobs, moved countries, divorces. I don't have much to stand on these days. Uh, so I need to try to build something up again. And there is a, the, the classic is the, the simple one, the rich dad, poor dad. I like those books. Just try to learn a little bit about the investments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, remember, I, I read uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad many years ago, and it's a very powerful book. Uh, well worth reading. Nick, thank you very much. Um, I think your message is, is very powerful. If you're um, listening to this on the podcast, um, then please do check out uh, the longer interview with Nick uh, on the earlier podcast where we talk about his journey um, and his new book, Executive Loneliness, um, which is coming out shortly. Um, but in the meantime, Nick, keep, you know, as I said on the, the Monday podcast, keep plugging away, keep banging the drum. I think it's an important message, so let's keep getting it out there. Thank, thank you. you very it, much. And thank you if you've, you've been listening and commenting, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to see them. Um, uh, but do join us again uh, for another Connected Leadership podcast live very soon.